Hello and welcome back. This is our last video for chapter 13, um, talking about neuronal pools and reflexes, which is kind of the other half of the chapter, I would say. Um, so talking about anatomy of the spinal cord and distribution of nerves is kind of the first half. The second half is focused primarily on reflexes. Um, so before we get to reflexes, though, we need to take a look at what's called neuronal pools. So if you remember, chapter 12 and 231 talk to you about how action potentials are generated at the dendrites and cell bodies with graded potentials. Those are summed together um, to either bring initial segment to threshold or not to trigger an action potential, which would per perpetuate that signal onto the next cell, whether it's another neuron or maybe a, a gland or a muscle. But in reality, most signals aren't traveling just on one neuron. It is a collection of neurons that are communicating through a particular neural circuit, if you will. So here we're just showing some examples of neuronal pools. We have um, five different kinds. We're just going to go through those and I'll give you some examples of um, where we might see these. Um, different patterns of pathways. So the first one is called divergence. So again, they're, they're just showing like one blue neuron to two purple ones, but there could be a divergent neuronal pool where you have 50 blue ones to 100 purple ones. So it's just more of a pattern than strictly three neurons in this particular neuronal pool. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're reading about these. So this divergence allows you to have a single message or a single stimulus be um, amplified in this particular pathway. So this would be like visual input is a good example of divergence. You have one sensory receptor or two, I guess, if you have two eyeballs. So this one source of sensory information gets split and sent to multiple parts of your brain. It goes to your visual cortex, it goes to the hypothalamus, it goes to the pineal gland, um, it goes to your cerebellum for reflexes. Um, so and visual kind of positioning. So the one stimulus coming in through vision is distributed to multiple locations and destinations in your brain. That's a good example of divergence. Convergence is like the reverse. So you have multiple sources of information coming in and converging onto a single target, which will then kind of make a decision based on all of those EPSPs and IPSPs, the summation of that information processing. Um, a good example of this would be what um, goes to control your diaphragm. So if we have, say, two excitatory neurons, or let's say three excitatory neurons, and one inhibitory neuron coming in, that's a really bad negative sign. There we go. So we are going to have a higher chance that this postsynaptic cell is going to be brought to threshold and it will be excited. Um, but what if we had three inhibitory neurons? The likelihood that that postsynaptic cell is going to be um, activated is going to be reduced. So convergence is multiple signals coming in and some summing on that postsynaptic neuron or a postsynaptic pool of neurons to determine where that signal is going to be sent. So for example, for your diaphragm in the phrenic nerve, there's gonna be neurons that when you inhale, you can't see my diaphragm, but your diaphragm contracts and it goes flat. This is inhalation. So it goes flat and then exhalation, your diaphragm has to relax and it goes back up to dome shape. If we didn't have the inhibitory neurons to tell your diaphragm to relax, you would inhale. And you wouldn't ever exhale because you wouldn't have those inhibitory neurons telling your diaphragm motor neurons to stop firing and you would just get contraction, contraction, contraction. So for a diaphragm, we need alternating sig signals of contract. So excitation, excitation, excitation for contraction. And then we have to turn that motor neuron off. So inhibitory, inhibitory, inhibitory to say, don't send signals to the diaphragm so we can relax and push the air out. So that's a good example of convergence. Um, serial processing is probably just your, what you normally think of as a pathway of neural uh, information. So one neuron fires, the next one receives a signal. If it's excitatory, it brings the neuron to threshold, it fires, it sends it. So it's just like a normal 
um, baton pass, right? So you're running and you pass the baton and then they have the baton and they're running and they pass the baton. So it's a linear pathway, okay? The next one is called parallel processing, which is, if, if you look at it, it's kind of like a combination of divergence and serial processing. So you have, um, but it's kind of multiple divergence and serial processing happening at the same time. So you have um, similar pools processing information at the um, similar times. We're going to see this in our withdraw reflex example at the end of this video, um, showing that your stimulation comes in from whatever stimuli triggers your reflex, and at the same time you have information being processed in your one leg and then in your arms and in your pain centers in your brain. They're all processing the stimuli at the same time. That's parallel processing. Um, and then the last one is called reverberation. This is like a built-in positive feedback loop where we might have a stimuli starting with the blue neuron, fires the purple neuron, fires the pink neuron. Okay, that's one particular path. And with the firing of that purple neuron, it's got a collateral which branches off and stimulates its stimulator. So by the act of triggering this reverberating pool, the blue neuron stimulates a purple neuron, which stimulates a blue neuron, which stimulates a purple neuron, which stimulates a blue neuron, which stimulates a purple neuron, and you get stuck in this positive feedback loop. And it will continue this loop plus be stimulating the pink neuron every time it fires to go off and do something else. And the only time that this whole pathway will be stopped is if we block that blue neuron from firing. If we have some inhibitory message coming in and blocking the blue neuron, then it's not gonna fire the purple neuron and the purple neuron will not continue stimulating the blue neuron. A good example of reverberating circuits is a very complex example, and just one part of it is your day-night rhythms, are also called circadian rhythms. Consciousness. So we have a positive feedback reverberating circuit keeping us awake during the daytime, and then we get external stimuli, the sun's going down, um, we're feeling fatigued, all of these others, the, the day, the hour, our bodies can kind of recognize it with these internal clocks. Um, that's gonna come in and block that reverberating circuit of keeping us conscious to allow us to go into an unconscious state. And then we'll be in a reverberating circuit of maintaining unconsciousness while we sleep. And then a signal is gonna come in and break that reverberating circuit, which would be like your alarm clock or your cat or you know whatever wakes you up in the morning is gonna be breaking that sleep unconscious reverberating circuit and something else will get you started back into that conscious reverberating circuit. All right, so that's what we call neuronal pools, just these different patterns of how messages are sent via neurons, okay? All right, so now we're going to take a look at reflexes. So reflexes are the simplest type of motor command. So there is no conscious processing of basics. Well, let me take that back. There can be some reflexes that are learned, what we call learned reflexes. But absent of learned reflexes, there is no conscious processing. It is a built-in, hardwired, stereotypical here's a stimulus, here's the response. And every time you give that stimulus, you're gonna get that response. And so that's kind of how you can think of reflexes. There are five parts to a reflex arc. We have them numbered here. So the first thing is the arrival of a stimulus. Okay, it's gonna activate the receptor. So in this case, it looks like it's a pain receptor because he's putting his hand down on attack. Yikes, could be heat, um, it could be, you know, a, a, a particular type of signal could be a whacking of a tendon. We'll see that in our knee-jerk reaction. Step two is activation of the sensory neuron. So we activate this, the receptor, sending an action potential. So that's kind of step two, sending that sensory neuron through our sensory pathways. There's our dorsal uh, root ganglion with the cell body of the unipolar neuron. There's our dorsal root um, going into, in this case, it would be somatic sensory, going into our dorsal root horn sorry, a dorsal gray horn. Um, and in this case, there is an interneuron, that's the white cell, um, but there doesn't always have to be. And so step three is what we call information processing between the sensory and the motor. Okay, so sensory information coming in, activating the, the receptor, activating the neuron, processing in the central nervous system, either brain or spinal cord. They're showing spinal cord here, but it could be either location. Then that information processing is gonna activate the motor neuron, 
And then the last step is a response by the effector. You're going to pull your hand away from the painful stimuli. So every time you get a painful stimuli, your response will be pulling away from the painful stimuli. That's the reflex. And it happens very quickly because do we see a conscious part of the brain in this pathway? We see a collateral going up to tell your brain that there's pain. But by the time the signal has gone to your brain and you're processing that it's pain, your hand has already moved away from the painful stimuli. So you may have experienced this before, like especially touching like a hot pan. You reach for the pan, you pull your hand away, and then you feel that it's burned. I know the time is very little, little but it's enough of a time delay between touching the hot pan and you recognizing that there's the pain that your hand has already been pulled away from that painful stimulus. And that's why reflexes are so important. They are built-in stereotypical responses to keep your body safe. If we had to think about and process every stimuli that came in before we could do a reaction, our bodies would be a lot more wore out and damaged and potentially irreversibly damaged by um, these damaging stimuli if we had to process all of that information. So thank you reflexes for freeing up some of our processing um, space in our cerebrum so we don't have to think about it, it's already kind of built in. So those are the five steps of a reflex arc. Of the reflexes that we could have, they are categorized or classified by these four um, options, I guess, or characteristics. So the first one is by development, okay? Are these reflexes that are built in as you being a human? So these are called innate. So innate reflexes, they're genetically or developmentally determined. You have them because you are human, since this is human anatomy and physiology. Or are they learned over time? So the best example of learned reflexes that I think most people are familiar with is driving, right? You are not born knowing how to drive a car. You do not have a reflex of how to operate a car. But as you learn to drive a car and you get more experiences, you have these built-in reflexes. So you're driving along and you see the, the light change from green to yellow. So you step on the gas. No, wait, that's the wrong reflex, sorry. So you slow down because you see that stimuli of the light changing. You have to process that and then make a decision. Now, sometimes it means stepping on the gas because you're already halfway through the intersection or coming close to it that slamming on your brakes would be dangerous because somebody could rear end you. That's the learned part. Learned reflexes take more time because they have to have a processing uh, take place. Innate reflexes are like that spinal reflex we just looked at of the withdrawal from the pain. We can classify reflexes by their response. What type of effector is doing the activity? If it's skeletal muscle, it's called somatic. We should be making that connection really good now. Somatic means skeletal and conscious. If it's visceral or autonomic, it's gonna be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. Yes, we do have reflexes in our heart. We do have reflexes in smooth muscle. We do have reflexes in our glands. We just don't have control over those because we do not control smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, but they do have reflective behaviors. We can also classify reflexes by their complexity of circuit, how many neurons are involved. We have the most simplest are called monosynaptic. There we go. My computer's kind of taking a little bit of pause here. So monosynaptic or polysynaptic is two or more up to a hundred or so synapses between the sensory and the motor, right? So a sensory directly onto motor, this is a monosynaptic. If there's any kind of interneuron, you're gonna have two or more synapses. And we'll see some examples of those later. And then lastly, the processing site. Is that information processing, that step three of the reflex arc, is it taking place in the spinal cord? It's called a spinal reflex. If it's taking place in the brain, it's called a cranial reflex. Kind of makes sense, right? So any reflex that you have, you should be able to describe it in these four categories. So the, probably the most well-known by the lay population um, is your the knee jerk reaction. So it's called the patellar reflex, right? So it's when, I know you can't see it, you'll do this in lab, but when you whack your knee and your leg kicks out, right? So this is the patellar reflex. I can classify this, it is an innate reflex because you're born with it. You don't have to think about your knee jerk reaction. It is a somatic reflex because it is skeletal muscle that is doing the activity. 
It is a monosynaptic reflex, and you'll see that here in a little bit, and it is a spinal reflex. So we could say our patellar reflex is a spinal monosynaptic somatic innate reflex. Whew, that's a mouthful. All right, so let's take a look at some examples of these reflexes. Here you go. Here is our um, knee-jerk reaction. So it's called a stretch reflex. And it is a stretch reflex because a stimulus is a stretched muscle. It is a stretched muscle, and the reflex is to protect against overstretching. So in this um, reaction, the stimulus is you're whacking your patellar tendon. And if you remember, your patellar tendon is connected to your patella, but it also is connecting to your rectus femoris. And all of your vastus muscles all connect to the patellar, to the tibial tuberosity via the patellar tendon. So if you whack on that, it's going to stretch those muscles a little bit. And to counter the potential damage of overstretching, we are going to contract the muscles around that receptor to um, prevent overstretch. So what's going to happen when you contract your um, quad muscles, your rectus femoris and all your vastus? Well, your response is your leg's going to kick out. Okay. And if we take a look at our reflex arc, here's a receptor, step one. Here's a sensory neuron, step two. Here's our integration center, step three. Here's our motor neuron, step four. And here's the effector, step five. So all five components of the reflex arc are there. And if you'll notice, we just called this a monosynaptic reflex because the sensory synapses directly onto the motor. You still have information processing, but it's information processing directly from sensory to motor. There is no interneuron in this particular reflex. Okay, so that is our monosynaptic reflex. We're going to take a closer look at this reflex because it's kind of a very cool, interesting receptor that is involved. We have what's called a muscle spindle. The muscle spindle is made up of what we call intrafusal muscle fibers. Okay, they're kind of smaller, more petite muscle fibers compared to your regular old skeletal muscle fibers, which are called extrafusal. And then there's a sensory region that is innervated, kind of wrapped around. You can kind of see the coiling here. That is the sensory receptor of that stretch response. So this goes to the um, CNS, basically the spinal cord that we just saw. That's the sensory receptor, and that's the sensory neuron. So step one, step two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's the thing. Let me see if I can stand. I usually do this in lecture, but... Lecture. So let's say I am stretching my quad like this, right? I'm stretching it. I'm stretching my quad way more than what would ever happen by me just tapping on my knee, right? So I'm tapping on my knee. I'm thinking about it so I can't really trigger my reflex. But that's not very much pull. So how come I, my leg is not trying to kick away from my stretch quad? because I'm stretching it way more than that patellar tap would do. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is when I'm consciously thinking about stretching my muscle, there are these what are called gamma efferents. You can see those on the diagram. They are maintaining the sensitivity of that sensory region in the intrafusal muscle fibers. So if somebody were to come and whack my knee in the stretched position, I still have sensitivity to that, and I could still trigger the reflex, even though my leg muscle is already stretched. So these gamma efferents, let's scoot back here. So these guys, the gamma efferents, are there to, they're coming from the conscious part of my brain, saying, okay, so Corey is stretching her quadricep, let's adjust these intrafusal muscle fibers to maintain the sensitivity of that sensory region. So when the muscle is stretched on purpose, I'm not gonna trigger the reflex, but I'm gonna maintain sensitivity. So if there happens to be a quick um, tap on my tendon, that means it could be potential danger and I can trigger the reflex still. So these micrographs, this is the muscle uh, spindle kind of a cool little organ just uh, embedded there in your regular old extrafusal muscle fibers. So that's always pretty cool to think that, yes, we have these automatic built-in reflexes, but they are precise to 
allow us to do conscious things and not trigger these automatic reflexes when we're doing conscious activities that could otherwise trigger those reflexes. Okay, the next example that we're gonna take a look at is the flexor reflex. So the flexor reflex is um, primarily taking advantage of the action of flexion, right? So pulling, the fle flexing of my bicep. So again, step one, painful stimulus. Step two, afferent neuron. Step three, information processing. Step four, motor command. Step five, flexor stimulated. All right, so all five of the components of our reflex arc are there. So just making sure we're tracking here. So in this case, we have the painful stimulus and the built-in response is to pull away from that painful stimulus. And so we're using our flexor group to do that. This was the hot pan example that I talked about earlier. Now, if we take a look at this particular reflex, can we classify it, right? It is a spinal reflex, check. It is a somatic reflex, check. It is innate because we are born with it, check. Monosynaptic or polysynaptic? Take a look at this integration center. One or two or more synapses. Between sensory and motor, look, we have a synapse here and we have a synapse here. This is polysynaptic. So this is a polysynaptic reflex because it's got an interneuron. And that's an easy way to tell. Plus it has some other fun stuff we're gonna take a look at. <clears throat> so in just the pathway itself, right? So here we have our stimulus, here we have our afferent pathway, our integration, efferent pathway, your hand pulls away from the hot pan, okay? But knowing what we know about muscles and that we have our antagonistic groups, if I'm going to be contracting my flexor, what am I doing to my extender? I'm stretching it, right? Do you think there's stretch receptors or stretch reflexes associated with my triceps? Well, yeah, so if I'm quickly flexing my flexor, I'm going to be stretching my extender and I don't wanna trigger the reflex back here. So we have to have a way to quiet this down, just like those gamma efferents quieted down my muscles when I was doing the, the, the teller reflex. <clears throat> so in this pathway, we have this, um, these other inhibitory neurons here, kind of the dotted lines ones, so while our flexors are being stimulated, our extensors are being inhibited. And what that does is if I'm quickly pulling away with my flexor, I'm not going to trigger a stretch reflex down here because of this. And this is what we call reciprocal inhibition. So you should see that in your notes or in the book somewhere. So reciprocal inhibition. And we usually are going to see that a lot when we see these kind of pulling away, withdraw, or flexor reflexes because of that way that our bodies organize with those opposing muscle groups. We have a flexor on one side and extender on the other. If we're going to flex one, we're going to stretch the other. If we're going to flex that one, we're going to stretch the other. So we've got to protect those um, antagonistic muscles from triggering a reflex in that muscle, the unused muscle, in this case, the uh, extenders, which would be your tricep. Okay, so let's take a look at the crossed extensor reflex, which is probably the most complex reflex we're going to take a look at. <laughs> this was that parallel processing that we talked about in neuronal pools. So again, let's identify our components of the reflex arc. Here is step one, here is step two, here is step three, here is step four, here is step five. Okay, so we've got all five component parts identified in this diagram. So now we can kind of know what we're talking about. So in this case, we have a couple different things that are happening. The response is a little bit more complex and it's called cross extensor because we have stimulus coming in on one side and we have response going out on both sides. So the information has to cross the spinal cord, usually at what are called the commissures. Um, there's gray and white commissures, in this case, the gray commissure anterior to the central canal. This area right here is called the commissure. So as this information is coming in, so imagine you're, you're walking down the hallway, you step on a tack or a Lego or you know something sharp and un, unbeknownst to you, it's in the hallway. 
and it hurts. So what's your original response or your, your response to this painful stimuli is to withdraw, right? To pull your leg up. But if you're standing on the earth, there's gravity and you can't pull pull of your feet up because then you'll fall over. And if you don't stabilize a leg that you didn't stamp on the tack um, and get engage that leg, then you're gonna fall over. And we don't want to damage our body any more than is already being damaged by stepping on the top. So we have to do a lot of things to make sure that we don't fall over after stepping on this tack. So let's just follow the first side, the same side stimulus. So this is this person's right leg um, stepping on the tack. That's gonna go, let's get the, my color here. So we're stepping on the tack, integration center, and now we want to pull away. So we need to do a flexor response. And flexors of the knee are your hamstrings, right? So that's these guys right here. So flexors are going to pull up. Now, what did we just talk about with our flexors here? we got to quiet our extensors. So here is our reciprocal inhibition turning off our extensors. So in the leg that's pulling up, we are flexing to pull away from the pain and we are quieting the extensors with reciprocal inhibition. Now, what about the other leg that's got to keep you stable on the floor or on the ground so you don't fall over? Well, that's going to cross the commissure here. And for straightening the leg and making it stable, we have to contract the extensors. So the extensors are now going to be contracting. But at the same time, we have to quiet those flexors so we don't trigger a reflex there, right? So that all that's happening in our leg section of our spinal cord. But then as you'll notice, we have all of this information also coming up to ascending tracks. So these interneurons are gonna be sending information up. So when you step on a tack and you're pulling up on one leg and like standing on the other, you might be like waving your arms to catch your balance. That's that parallel processing of this one bit of information coming in and we're processing it simultaneously. <clears throat> and then eventually the pain signal will reach your brain and then you can respond verbally um, to the pain that you are feeling. All righty. There is a word, a couple words that go along with this uh, stimulus and response on the same side and the different side. So in your notes, you'll see this. It's also in the reflexes lab. Ipsilateral means the stimulus and response are on the same side. Contralateral is the stimulus and response are on opposite sides. So because the stimulus is on that guy's right foot and he has a response of straightening on the left leg, that is a contralateral response. So contralateral when it crosses over to the opposite side. So if you, you know, get a stimulus here and you have a response on the other side, that would be an example of a contralateral response. Okay. All right. So that wraps up our discussion on reflexes. Um, that is the uh, last video for chapter 13. So the next time I will see you, it will be on chapter 14 with the brain. See you later. Bye.